Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Lake Superior Quality Innovation Network Pain Assessment and Management Webinar. Your host, Gavin Bates, will begin. Thank you. Good afternoon, and welcome to today's Pain Assessment and Management Webinar presented by the Lake Superior Quality Innovation Network. The Lake Superior Quality Innovation Network is comprised of three organizations, MPRO in Michigan, Metastar in Wisconsin, and Stratus Health in Minnesota. Together, we support the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services priorities for healthcare quality improvement in each organization's respective state. This slide contains the CE disclosure information for this presentation. The planners and faculty have no declared conflicts of interest. Please stay on the line until the end of the call to receive the CE evaluation information. Now, I would like to introduce you to today's speaker, Dr. James Michener. Dr. Michener is the Medical Director for MPRO and is an attending physician in the Department of Emergency Medicine at St. Joseph's Mercy Hospital in Ann Arbor, Michigan. At this time, I would like to turn it over to Dr. Michener. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and for those of you on the East, uh, West Coast, uh, good morning. Um, We'll start off with the objectives for today's webinar is to review the neuroanatomy and the physiology of pain, discuss concepts of uh, proper pain management, discuss options for pain assessment, and review the long-term complications associated with narcotics, including diagnosis, dependence, tolerance, and addiction. So I'll start off with your uh, four take-home points for today's webinar. First of all, Pain is subjective, which means that it's different things to different people. Secondly, treatment of chronic pain is a lot different than the treatment for acute pain. Third, the goal for management of chronic pain is control, not total resolution of the pain. And uh, fourth, um, obviously drugs are not always the answer. So pain is what? A nasty four-letter word, a common reason for physician visits, under-recognized, under-treated, measured as the fifth vital sign, or all of the above. And I hope that you'll agree that it's all of the above. So it's been described as, or defined as, an unpleasant sensory and emotional experience associated with actual or potential tissue damage or described in terms of such damage. Another definition is whatever the pain experiencing person says it is, is existing whenever he or she says it does. So just a brief uh, synopsis of epidemiology, there's at least 100 million Americans who have chronic pain and about 25 million people uh, with acute pain annually. About 90% of Americans at one time or another will self-report regular pain. Uh, among uh, residents in nursing homes, the incidence of chronic pain is between 45 and 80 percent. About half of all people feel uncomfortable taking medications for pain, and pain has serious effects on lifestyle, including interference with sleep, with work, and uh, making people anxious, irritable, and depressed. Um, a relatively low-ball estimate of the annual cost in the United States are about $100 billion a year, for the diagnosis, management, and treatment of pain. A lot of myths and misconceptions about pain. Um, pain is a normal part of aging. That's not true. The level of pain can be determined objectively. That is false. Uh, chronic pain always indicates presence of serious disease. That isn't always correct. Patients in long-term care say they hurt in order to get attention. No solid evidence of that. Minor illness and injuries are less painful than severe ones. Not true. Psychological pain has no physiological basis. Also not true. Drug, over, drug abusers overreact to pain. Um, no solid evidence for that. And the regular use of analgesics can lead to addiction. So all of these are common myths and misconceptions about uh, pain. What are some of the barriers to adequate treatment? <clears throat> A blunted response on the part of elderly patients which means they don't react the same as those of us who are younger would. There's cognitive and communication barriers, particularly people uh, in, uh, with dementia, people with uh, language and speech difficulties. There's cultural and social biases, both on the part of patients as well as their caregivers. 
Coexisting illnesses and multiple medications can have effect on the expression of uh, pain, poor assessment skills by nursing and other staff, and skilled nursing facility systems issues. Uh, nursing homes that have high staff turnover uh, result in having people who, uh, staff members that is, who are not aware of changes in a long-term resident's condition and therefore not be able to easily recognize uh, acute pain. Consequences of inadequate treatment include disturbances of sleep and mobility, decreased socialization, uh, depression, inappropriate prescribing of psychotropic medications for agitation when what they really need is control of their pain, and increased uh, costs for the healthcare system. Just a few slides basically, briefly on the history of pain. Prior to the 19th century, there was a belief uh, among the ancient um, healers that uh, pain was a direct result of breathing bad air or an imbalance of humors. Um, some thought that it was due to the motion of planets. Others believed in a religious cause for pain. It was God or the spirits that was uh, causing them to suffer. And then in the 19th century, with the dawn of modern science, uh, we had the germ theory, which was the belief that there were little germs or little bugs that were behind every uh, disease and that you could use your scientific knowledge and inquiry to find out what these hidden processes due to these germs were. Um, so there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of effort, a lot of concentration on identifying the causes of disease. Um, by the 20th century, we had an explosion in medical knowledge and technology with tremendous advances in the fields of pathophysiology and pharmacology. And that led up to what we call the biomedical model which basically said that all real disease can be identified and that if it couldn't be identified, then the patient basically had psychological problems, hysteria, et cetera. And there was this profound confidence, actually overconfidence, in the ability to science to be able to explain everything. So just in a brief schematic form, we have the biomedical uh, model of pain. If somebody has a pain, then the physician says, well, is there an identifiable problem? And if there is and you would go ahead and treat the patient, and if it's not, then they're obviously crazy. Okay, so with that background, we can now talk about the four different uh, categories of pain, the four different pain types, and those include the nociceptive pain, inflammatory pain, neuropathic pain, and functional pain. So starting off with nociceptive pain, the, uh, the issue here is that you have painful stimuli. So uh, drastic changes in temperature or a mechanical force, such as hitting your thumb with a hammer, or chemical irritants, uh, you know, some kind of chemical that you might be using in a hobby or um, in your workplace that causes irritation of the skin and your hands. And that sends signals up to the spinal cord and then to the brain that tells you that, gee, this is really hurting. So an example would be if you put your hand over a hot burner or a hot stove um, that's obviously a noxious stimulus, and your brain perceives that as, as painful, and you want to do whatever you can to limit the amount of pain, so you would withdraw your hand from the hot stove in an effort to prevent further damage. It's basically part of the body's alarm system. You're feeling something that is very uncomfortable, and you're doing something about it. The second type is inflammatory pain. Here, the, the stimulus is some kind of inflammation, in, typically in the skin or other body parts, where you have the different cells of the body that are coming to the rescue, and they're secreting chemicals that irritate the nerves that go to the spinal cord and then to the brain and tell you this hurts. So your classic example is like a, a bad sunburn here on, on this kid's uh, forearm um, or an injury to your foot uh, with the development of infection. So here you have, regardless of whether or not it's tissue damage or inflammatory changes, um, you have this what's called sensitizing soup, where you have these various chemicals and molecules that basically act together to irritate the nerves. And the nerve endings have what we call high threshold nociceptors, which means that um, the uh, threshold to excite the nerve whenever you have a painful stimulus is typically very high when there's no stimulus, but then when you have the stimulus, it lowers the threshold and it makes it 
uh, easier for that nerve to get excited and send impulses to the spinal cord. So you basically, each nerve uh, starts off with a lower, with a higher threshold, and then it converts to a lower threshold whenever you have a um, uh, exciting stimulus. Um, so these, these, they're what's called silent nociceptors. So they're basically asleep and they don't do anything until they encounter an inflammatory um, uh, impulse. And then there's um, a couple of terms you should be aware of. Allodynia, which means that things that normally wouldn't hurt now do. And there's hyperalgesia, which means more pain than usual from a noxious stimulus. So the picture on the left there, you have uh, somebody with a, a rash, and normally the skin of your back wouldn't hurt. But when you touch the rash, it does. So that's allodynia. Hyperalgesia is when you get more pain than usual for a noxious stimulus. So here's somebody who's had a uh, sunburn, and obviously the entire back is burned, and so all you got to do is just touch that a little bit, and you get pain, whereas if they didn't have the sunburn you touched them, they wouldn't get any pain at all. So that's hyperalgesia. More pain than usual is causing that you to feel pain. And then the third type of pain is neuropathic pain. The problem here is not a noxious stimulus. It's not an inflammatory agent. It's basically the nerve itself. So um, the pain system itself has been injured, and but there's no noxious stimuli and there's no tissue damage associated with inflammation. Um, some people have described this as the fire alarm is always on, but there's no emergency. Um, so your classic examples are your peripheral neuropathies, such as diabetic neuropathy. Patients who get shingles uh, from herpes zoster, you get post herpetic neuralgia, chronic low back pain with damaged nerves. These are all examples of where it's the nervous system that is affected and not actually um, pain from a noxious stimuli or uh, inflammatory situation. Um, there's also uh, central causes, spinal cord injury, stroke. Um, there's uh, what's known as central, central pain syndrome that's, uh, for example, due to migraine headaches or fibromyalgia, where, again, the problem is in the nerves or the nervous system and not uh, noxious stimulus. This has been... Over the years, neuropathic pain has been poorly understood for physicians, and uh, as I uh, mentioned before, if there was no obvious anatomic disturbance, then it was thought that these people had psychological problems. But um, further research has shown us that neuropathic pain is actually what was previously thought to be psychological. So, again, samples of allodynia and hyperalgesia, things that normally don't hurt that do, and things that normally wouldn't hurt when you put a light stimulus on do. And the final is functional. Here, there's no uh, noxious stimulus. There's no inflammation. The nerves are normal. And this is, this is purely psychological pain where there's no cause that can be identified. Very difficult to diagnose, particularly if it's acute. So there's other ways of describing pain. Acute pain is generally defined as pain with duration of less than six months, whereas chronic is when it's more than six months. Causalgia is a term that we use for burning pain. Um, when, you, when you sense something that is burning, even though you haven't touched anything hot. Breakthrough pain is defined as acute exacerbation of chronic pain, not relieved with the usual uh, long-term sustained release medications. Other descriptions, cutaneous pain is direct, it's acute, it's highly localized. And the origin here is in the outer surface of the skin and just below the skin in the dermis as well as subcutaneous tissue. Somatic pain is typically uh, easily localized. It's uh, from uh, injuries or inflammation of tendons, muscles, joint, joints, bones, and nerves and cells. It's a, described as a throbbing, aching type pain. Visceral pain, on the other hand, is very poorly localized and typically in the internal organs, such as the appendix, the gallbladder, the intestines often described by patients as a squeezing or cramping, bloating sensation. And then there's referred pain where the body interprets pain in the body part that's not really where the uh, site of the injury or the site of the problem is. So um, with that, we'll basically cover Neuroanatomy 101. Very, very few slides. 
I don't want to turn you off. We'll just cover some basic things that you need to know. So here's a rough schematic of what the spinal cord looks like. And when you have uh, exposure to a nociceptive pain, you have a nociceptive afferent nerve fiber. Afferent means going toward the brain or toward the spinal cord. And you have impulses going from typically from the skin where the pain is. It then goes to the, to the uh, spinal cord. It jumps across the synapse to this interneuron. And then, interestingly enough, it crosses to the other side, and then it goes up toward the brain through the spinal cord. Um, one part of the pain stimulus goes to the thalamus, which is the part of the brain that senses uh, pain and discomfort, and that in turn sends uh, signals to the somatosensory cortex, which is the part of the brain that says, this hurts. It tells you that this hurts. Another uh, pathway goes up to the limbic forebrain, which is involved with emotions, and that's the part that's involved with swearing. So you say, damn, this hurts. Um, and then the brain says, well, we've got to do something about this. So it sends signals back down to the spinal cord, again, through, the, through uh, separate pathways, um, and it goes down the spinal cord, and then it goes um, back through the nerve, back to the muscle and all that. And, for example, if you put your uh, hand on a hot stove, the muscles contract and it pulls the hand away. So that's basically the, uh, mus the uh, motor response to a painful stimulus through the spinal cord and through the peripheral nerves. Enough on that. So uh, now we talk about factors that are associated with pain expression, and they're going to vary according to age and gender. Women, for example, uh, supposedly like to are more likely to express and seek treatment. And physicians have historically had a tendency to underestimate uh, women's expression of pain. There's cultural and ethnic um, differences, uh, which may depend on whether or not family members are in the room. A lot of this is learned behavior. Uh, the emotional state plays a role. So obviously, if you're anxious, if you're depressed, if you have very poor social support at home, your reaction to pain is going to be different than somebody who doesn't have those factors. And then, of course, there's cognitive ability. Somebody who has um, difficulty with memory, say from dementia or from a previous stroke, they're not going to be able to express pain as compared to somebody who's healthy. Pain assessment. Um, it's important, obviously, to uh, make an accurate pain assessment. You could start off by saying, not do you have pain, but maybe it's better sometimes to say, do you have any ache? Do you have any soreness? Do you have any discomfort anywhere? Because a lot of people, particularly chest pain, will say they don't have pain. They have burning. They have uh, squeezing. They have tightness. So if you use the word pain, you may not get, uh, you may not get an accurate response to their discomfort. For patients who are cognitively impaired, you may want to ask caregivers or family members. You want to look for subtle changes in their behavior. Again, this is where it's important to have staff retention in extended care facilities because they get to know their residents. They can tell you when there's things that just aren't right that would be a clue that they might be having a painful condition somewhere. What pain treatments is the patient currently receiving? And how does the presence of their pain affect their activities of daily living, sleeping, their mood? And then there's standard uh, tools that we use to quantify pain, which is useful in comparing the pain they're having today with, say, the pain they're having an hour from now or tomorrow. One of them is the PQRST mnemonic, so P for provoking factors. Q describes the quality of their pain, burning, tightness, squeezing, pressure, cramping, etc. R is for radiation of the pain to different parts of the body and the region of the pain. S stands for the severity of the pain uh, on a scale, say, of 1 to 10, and associated symptoms. And T is the timing. How did the pain start in relation to an injury? Um, there's also visual analog scales where you can ask the uh, patient to circle a number on a scale from 0 to 10. Um, sometimes you just leave the line blank and you ask the patient to put an X um, anywhere on the uh, continuum from no pain on the left to worst possible pain on the right. For kids, uh, we use the Juan Baker Faces Pain Rating Scale where you ask the kid to point to the face that describes how severe his or her pain is. 
And again, you can use this initially, and then you can go back and use them again after you've treated the pain. There are a few things that are peculiar to the elderly in terms of pain. First of all, they have an increased pain threshold. So a threshold, a pain threshold is the earliest point at which someone perceives a noxious stimulus as being painful, and it's believed that the elderly people can tolerate painful stimuli, uh, have a higher threshold than, than the rest of us. Um, they have decreased pain tolerance. So tolerance is the lowest level of stimulation at which a person will stop or attempt to stop the stimulus. And they, uh, the elderly also have uh, delayed reaction times. They have physical impairments. So if they've had a stroke and they um, fall down and they land on, for example, a, a hot heating pad or something, you know, they're not going to be able to uh, get away from that because of their uh, inability to uh, move. And then they have cognitive defects, as I mentioned. Factors associated with chronic pain in the elderly, including osteoarthritis, uh, rheumatoid arthritis, osteoporosis, vertebral compression fractures, neuropathic pain syndromes, including diabetic neuropathy, shingles, trigeminal neuralgia, side effects of chemotherapy, peripheral vascular disease, uh, leg cramps due to poor circulation, uh, extremity amputations, pressure ulcers, and uh, immobility after a stroke, contractures um, from uh, chronic neurologic disease. Pain assessment in the elderly, um, abnormalities and vital signs are more likely to be elevated in acute pain than chronic pain, but that's not always true. You can't, you can't rely on that 100%. You want to pay particular attention, uh, attention to facial expressions. Uh, that might be a clue. Uh, and other nonverbal clues, including grunting, moaning, um, grinding the teeth, the whimpering, um, changes in their behavior in terms of restlessness, agitation. If they're normally continent and now they're incontinent, that might be a clue. Changes in uh, activity, such as eating, sleeping, walking, and behavior might be another clue. We often see people in the emergency department have been sent in by the, by the nursing home for no other reason than, you know, they're not eating, they're not sleeping, they're grimacing for no reason, and uh, they need to be evaluated for a painful condition. Acute versus chronic pain, it's important to remember that acute pain is a symptom, whereas chronic pain is a disease. Acute pain typically has an identifiable source and physical findings to go along with it, whereas chronic pain is often uh, without a clear source or physical findings. Uh, acute pain has a protective function, including uh, in terms of being a response to disease or injury, whereas chronic pain is often maladaptive and becomes the disease itself. Acute pain is often associated with changes in vital signs, uh, which is not always the case with chronic pain. And acute pain ideally will resolve with treatment, and chronic pain is just basically something that has to be managed and uh, typically does not go away. Okay, now we're going to switch gears, and in the remaining slides, we're going to talk about pain management. So the goals are to identify the cause of pain whenever possible. Secondly, to decrease the level of pain in a way that is safe and protective for the patient. Third is to always look at what the end game is, which is to improve functioning and the quality of life for the individual. And finally, to minimize side effects of any pharmacologic therapy that you're going to use. Um, and proper pain treatment begins with a institutional commitment uh, from the senior leadership, uh, particularly. And what you want to focus is on focus on is communication in terms of using a standard pain descriptor vocabulary and the proper assessment tools. Uh, ideally, you want to have a pain management coordinator working with a team, and you want to do periodic documentation of ongoing pain assessment as well as treatment. Education is important uh, initially for new staff as well as continuing education for the senior staff. And then uh, human resources needs to be involved in terms of doing whatever is necessary to maintain staff uh, retention because, again, that's important in, in having somebody who knows the resident of the nursing home can recognize subtle changes uh, in their condition that would indicate a painful situation. Continuity of care 
is very important in uh, nursing homes. In terms of pharmacologic therapy, you want to uh, administer pain medication routinely and not on a as needed basis for patients with chronic pain. You obviously want to start off with the least invasive route of administration, which is oral medication. You want to begin with a low dose and titrate upward. And uh, you want to remember that you have to reassess and adjust the dose frequently to optimize the management in terms of pain relief. You want to use only one drug if you can. Um, you don't want to use more than one long-acting drug at a time. You want to use other drugs that aren't classically analgesics, uh, such as muscle relaxants, drugs to reduce anxiety, uh, anti-vomiting agents, antispasmodics for um, gastrointestinal-related pain, and even antidepressants. you got to remember that with the opiates, you have constipation issues, and you want to prophylax against that. And, again, you always want to remember uh, to have ongoing assessment for pain control and monitoring for side effects. So here's a brief schematic of what you do, starting with on the left-hand side there, if you have a patient with nociceptive pain, you can start off with just plain Tylenol, acetaminophen. If that works, keep doing it. If not, then the next step would be to advance to a non anti-inflammatory drug, such as ibuprofen or Motrin, um, if the pain is localized. You can also use Tramadol, which is a uh, non-NSAID uh, uh, pain reliever. If that works, great, keep doing it. If not, then the third step would start off with an antidepressant from the selective serotonin and norepinephrine reuptake inhibitor class, uh, okay, a drug like duloxetine or Cymbalta or Venlafazine. I love that name, Venlafazine, um, or Effexor. If that works, fine, keep doing it. If not, then you go to opiates. Notice that you don't start out with opiates initially. If you can avoid doing so, that would be your fourth line of therapy for somebody with nociceptive pain. On the other hand, on the right-hand side, if you have somebody with neuropathic pain, like diabetic neuropathy, post neuralgia, here you want to start off with duloxetine, cymbalta, and lampazine, um, Exer. Or you can start off with a drug like gabapentin, which is Neurontin, or Pregabalin, which is Lyrica. And if that works fine, keep doing it. If not, then you go to an opiate. Again, the idea here is don't start off right out of the, bar, right out of the gate uh, with, uh, with an opiate, if you can avoid it. So briefly, acetaminophen is a drug you know well. There's multiple medications, multiple formulations, rather. Um, starting off with uh, 1,000 milligrams every six hours is an excellent first-line choice. The primary toxicity with acetaminophen is liver. So if somebody's taking both Tylenol and uh, Percocet and Vicodin, two drugs that have acetaminophen in them, um, you don't want to mix and match. And you want to avoid alcohol because that may have effects on the way the liver uh, detoxifies acetaminophen. Again, non anti-inflammatory drugs are useful for nociceptive pain. Uh, the way they work is that they decrease peripheral sensitization to the nociceptive nerve receptors. Um, they've been shown to work better than a patient-controlled analgesic pump alone uh, for patients with post-operative pain. You don't have the problems with constipation or drug dependence. They do have a ceiling effect, which means that once you hit 800 milligrams of Motrin three times a day, it doesn't do any good to, to decrease the dose beyond that. Um, one of the most popular drugs in the management of acute pain is Ketorolac, which is an intravenous formulation of a non-steroidal, uh, known as a trade name as Toradol, and it is a drug of choice for patients that are opiate naive, particularly works well for things like kidney stones, and biliary colic, and other gastrointestinal types of pain. And a dose of 30 milligrams of Toradol is roughly equivalent in terms of analgesic properties uh, of uh, 10 milligrams of morphine. Uh, there are some risks for the use of non in the elderly. Uh, nausea and vomiting is more prevalent. you got to worry about effects on the kidney um, in terms of uh, in inhibiting kidney function. You typically see a decrease in your glomerular filtration rate by about 1% per year after you hit the age of 40. And so what happens is you normally would spot kidney problems by noticing a rise in the creatinine level. But as you get 
uh, older, your body muscle mass decreases. You don't make a creatinine. You don't make as much creatinine. So we don't use that as a way of monitoring kidney function. Rather, we use the glomerular filtration rate, which can be estimated. Um, and most laboratory tests now will estimate uh, GFRs for you. And, of course, the long-term effects for kidney disease include hyperkalemia, um, peripheral edema, and hypertension. Nonsteroids also have antiplatelet effects, uh, inhibiting the function of platelets, so that's manifest as gastrointestinal bleeding. And uh, some people believe there are adverse effects on uh, healing of bone fractures. Narcotics, um, the two major categories of weak narcotics include codeine, hydrocodone, and oxycodone. And some of them are combined with acetaminophen. Probably the most popular uh, narcotic these days is Norco, a combination of hydrocodone and acetaminophen. And you'll notice that it's replaced uh, Vicodin because it has a smaller dose of acetaminophen, 325 milligrams than Vicodin. So that's, that's very commonly used now. Strong narcotics include morphine, uh, trade names OxyContin and Oromorph, hydromorphone, trade names Allowed, fentanyl, Duracesic, and Meperidine or Demerol, which we hardly ever use anymore as a, because of uh, side effects and uh, toxicity. Morphine is basically the prototype for uh, IV narcotics, uh, IV high-end narcotics. Significant pain relief, how often, uh, however, often requires doses high as 20 milligrams. You want to start at a very low dose if the individual is not used to morphine. So if I'm treating an 85-year-old uh, with a broken bone, I'm probably going to start off with 2.5 milligrams of morphine. If it's somebody younger or somebody who's had morphine before, I might start off with 5 or even 10 milligrams, depending on their weight. You want to increase the dose gradually, redose every 2 to 4 hours. Uh, there's a huge individual variation in sensitivity. That's why I think it's always good to start off low dose. Um, they, uh, people, people that get morphine often get this uh, phenomenon where their arm gets red at the, uh, at, the, at the IV catheter site. That's basically due to localized release of histamine, and it's not truly a uh, systemic allergic reaction. Sometimes I warn patients this. Um, that they could get that. And nausea vomiting is a prominent side effect with morphine. That's why uh, a lot of doctors now prefer to allow it, uh, because you have less incidence of vomiting, and a lot of doctors like drugs that have a lower dose, even though it may be the same um, effect in terms of pain relief. So we like to order one or two or milligrams of allowed it because it just, you know, we're not too anxious as, as we would be if we gave 10 milligrams of morphine. This is small, we like smaller numbers. Um, main reason for improved uh, outcome is uh, that we give, we like to give less of something. Um, every three to four hour dosing is ideal once the pain is controlled. Lots of adverse effects with narcotic, narcotics include sedation, constipation, um, nausea and vomiting, which sometimes often actually requires treatment with an antiemetic like Zofran. And then tolerance can develop over time, so if you keep giving in doses of uh, dilaudid or morphine, you're hopefully less likely to have a continued vomiting. Respiratory depression is the thing we really worry about. Uh, fortunately, there's an antidote for that, that's naloxone or Narcan, which can be given by just about any route except orally. Management of chronic pain, you want to use sustained release narcotics for around the clock pain control. You always got to keep in mind the possibility of breakthrough pain, and for that, you want to use the short-acting or immediate-acting uh, versions of the drug that you've used for the long-acting medication. So if you're using um, OxyContin, for example, for long-term um, pain, uh, then you might want to use MS-Contin or Roxanol Elixir on a PRN basis, uh, and the dose is typically up to 20% of your total 24-hour dose of your long-acting um, if you uh, increase the dose of your long-acting medication, you want to do the same thing with the short-acting PRN medication as well. And if you have a concern that the patient is using drugs to, uh, the patient with chronic pain, that is, is using drugs to get high, then there are agents out there that have combinations of the, um, of the agonist drug, that is, the drug that reduces pain, as well as a, the, the, um, 
want to say, a drug that blocks the euphoria, that's the antagonist. So the classic example there is uh, Suboxone, which is a combination of buprenorphine, which is the agonist, and Narcan, which is uh, the drug that prevents uh, euphoria. The idea here is when you're managing pain is not to have fluctuations of pain like you see on the left side of the graph there where you have wide swings between having adverse effects at the top and having persistent pain at the bottom. If you look at the graph on the right side, right side there, you have just the amount of pain control without having adverse uh, reactions, without having adverse side effects. Patient controlled analgesia, here the, the idea is that the nurse presets the medication doses and timing. You can get lockout times, uh, which uh, prevents the patient from administering an overdose until a, a preset interval has been reached. Advantage include uh, individualization for pain control, and they don't have to press the nurse's call button periodically and wait for them to bring the medication. Disadvantages include a malfunction of the pump. Um, they often will use a stronger drug, a stronger dose rather, and would be required and uh, not getting the lockout times uh, right. Epidural pain control is another option here. Um, the anesthesiologist places a catheter into the epidural space. It's a catheter pump, which the patient can wear on his or her belt, and you have the medication in the reservoir. Uh, the, the medication is given continuously or intermittently. The advantages here is that the pain medication goes to the site where the pain is, and you can get rapid and prolonged pain relief with fewer side effects. Disadvantages are the um, hassle of getting pump refills. There's always a risk of infection whenever you have a catheter, and it's inconvenient for the patient in terms of swimming and showering. Adjunct medications, which I alluded to earlier, include uh, antiemetics, and they can actually have pain relief effects on their own. Examples would be promethazine, prochlorpyrazine, metoclopramide, and dancitron. The two that we probably use the most common are dancitron or zofran and metoclopramide or reglan. Uh, muscle relaxants for pain that is secondary to painful muscle spasms. And examples here would be diazepam or valium, cyclopenzapine or fluxoril, baclofen, which is particularly used for patients with multiple sclerosis uh, when they have painful uh, muscle spasms. And there are some others that I've listed there. Steroids are useful for neuropathic pain, um, and that includes prednisone and dexamethasone. They're also useful for some patients with migraines, um, visceral pain, and inflammatory pain. Antispasmodics for painful abdominal cramps as a, as a result of uh, intestinal, um, gallbladder, or uh, urinary bladder spasms. Examples here would be Imodium, um, combination of Dysonoxalite and Atropine, or Lamotol or Oparamide. Antidepressants are particularly useful for migraines and patients with causalgia. Um, they are believed to work by uh, enhancing the inhibitory pathways that go down the spinal cord that block the reuptake of the neural transmitters. Examples here would be Amitriptyline or Elvil, Tredidone, Desirel, and the SSRIs such as Fluxin or Prozac. And then anticonvulsants can be uh, useful for neuropathic pain and neuralgia, although not all of these agents are approved by the FDI, FDA for that, uh, for that indication, but they're popularly, popularly used. So, for example, Gamapentin or Neurontin, Pregabalin or Verica, uh, valproic acid, uh, Depakote, Clonazepam, or Clonopin would be examples there. Other things you can do to control pain is adjusting the room temperature, changing wet or soiled sheets, um, rotating the patient every couple of hours in the bed using an egg crate mattress, keeping them warm with blankets, range of motion exercises done by physical therapy to prevent contractures. Complementary therapies, including uh, rice, breast ice, compression, elevation, uh, peripheral nerve blocks, uh, physical and occupational therapy, repositioning the patients, um, use of superficial heat or cold or massage therapy for cutaneous stimulation. Neural stimulation or acupuncture has been used in cases. Chiropractic uh, is helpful for many people. 
um, psychological, spiritual, and peer counseling, alternative medicine, including herbs and naturopathic uh, therapy, guided imagery through uh, meditation, relaxation techniques, aromatherapy, magnet therapy. I have a cousin who actually treats her arthritis by taking iron pills and putting a magnet over her knee. Um, some people believe in that. Uh, use of music, art, or drama, biofeedback, and hypnosis. Uh, the point is, is that different things work for different people, and if these things are useful in getting them off their narcotics and their medications, that would be great. So I'll end up by talking about some pitfalls. Uh, uh, underestimation of pain is universal. Underdosing is universal. Underdosing of medication. Remember what the patient's priorities are. Most things you can't fix, pain you can. Um, I'll talk briefly about narcotic issues as we see them in the emergency department. So here's a patient being examined by the doctor, um, and the patient says, doctor, my patient's a 10. The doctor says, limp, or wimp, liar, drug seeker. So um, in terms of what are some of the issues with narcotic therapy tolerance, is basically a pharmacologic issue where you need a higher dose for consistent pain relief. Uh, and uh, apparent tolerance is where the patient has abnormal pain sensitivity or disease progression. So you always got to think, is this patient just getting tolerant or is the pain, painful condition getting worse? Dependence is uh, diagnosed when you have an abrupt cessation and they have a physiologic counter-reaction. So, for example, they are vomiting diarrhea um, or they're having pyloerection, where their hair is standing up on their arms. Um, and treatment for a good example of, um, of drugs that have dependence are beta blockers and opioids. Addiction, however, is where you have a pervasive and daily pattern of dysfunctional drug use, where you're using drugs for um, reasons other than to control the pain. And here, the adverse consequences are fear of loss of control, and your whole life is focused on getting, getting your fix, a procurement of the drugs. Addiction is when a patient has a psychological need for a drug that exceeds his or her physical need. So the behavior is then directed toward acquiring and using the drug for its psychic effect. Chronic pain and narcotics is it's estimated that at least 50% of adults currently abuse alcohol and or drugs. Um, about the same number of chronic pain patients are addicted. Uh, however, you always got to remember that it may be a, an issue of poorly managed pain. Um, they may be undertreated, uh, and it's very frustrating that a primary care doctor will walk up and tell them to go to the emergency room because they don't want to deal with it. Um, and non-medical use of opioids is now the second most prevalent type of illicit drug abuse. And there's been, uh, you probably read articles in the lay press about um, the epidemic of prescription drug abuse. Drug-seeking behavior, uh, clues are uh, repeated uh, complaints of losing their prescription, multiple providers, giving medications, frequent visits to the emergency department, or frequent requests for early refills. Again, you always got to be cognizant of the fact that it may be a sign of inadequate analgesia, so-called pseudo-addiction. And uh, tolerance and physical dependence is a physiological, our physiological phenomenon, whereas addiction is psychological. Um, here's a great quote from a pain specialist. Because 6 to 15% of the population abuses drugs, the history of pain management is marked by the undertreatment of the other 85 to 94%. So chronic pain in the emergency department, uh, we often can't tell. Um, and uh, we typically will give them the benefit of the doubt when we don't know. Um, we're always worried about um, missing uh, somebody who really has legitimate pain uh, more than giving uh, somebody who's, who's an addict some medications. A lot of people would rather, uh, would rather give 100 addicts pain medication when they don't need it rather than miss one patient. Who, uh, who legitimately does have pain. So treat the patient, treat the pain while the patient's in the emergency department, give a small outpatient supply, and make sure that they have close follow-up. 
And that's the presentation. Thank you for paying attention. We'll be happy to entertain any questions. Go ahead and open up the line for questions now. So ladies and gentlemen, if you have any questions, please press the number one key. Again, if you have any questions at this time, please press the number one key. Our first question is going to come from Kristen Wood from the Maple Maple Lawn Medical. Please go ahead. Krista? I have a question. Okay. There are no questions in queue at this time. All right. No questions? Excellent. Uh, thank you for joining us. Day. Excuse me, Mr. Bates, I'm sorry. We have one from Joan Winstrom from Watertown Home. Please go ahead. Yes, right. and the question is, um, you know, we have patients that have chronic pain, but they always rate high in their in their pain assessment. And um, is there any trick to, to try and talk to them? You know, they're not always at a 10. You know what I mean? Sure. I know exactly what you mean. So here's a couple of tricks. One, you can go back in the medical record and find out what their uh, past history has been when they say 10 out of 10 pain. And if you're lucky, you'll find a note in there from a patient's physician or a psychiatric consultant or a pain specialist consultant or an addiction specialist that will say, patient always says they have 10 out of 10 pain even though um, they've been observed to be um, texting on their cell phone or laughing in the room or uh, obviously not expressing any pain when nobody was looking. The second thing you can do is pick up the phone and call their primary care physician. It says, you know, Mr. Jones here says he has 10 out of pain and find out what it's like when they're in the office. Uh, those, those are two of the tricks that I use. Thank you. Are there any more questions? There are no more questions in queue at this time. Oh, there's one in the chat. Um, I see one from Jennifer. Does the doctor have any more to say about magnet therapy? Not really. I've never tried it. I've never prescribed it. So I, I really can't claim any expertise with magnet therapy. All right. Um, if that is... Oh, I see a, a question. Are we able to print these slides? Um, well, we sent out a link uh, to the slides uh, prior to this webinar. Um, we will, when we post the YouTube recording, we'll have a link where you can download the handouts and the slides, um, and you'll be able to print them from there. And, um, Gavin, we have a couple more people who came into queue. Okay. Okay, we have one from um, Katie Paquette from um, Pleasant Manor. Please go ahead. Hi. I just had a quick question on how much involved have you been with the new essential oils coming out with pain management um, and using it from a holistic standpoint? Uh, I personally don't have any experience. I, my, my clinical background is emergency medicine. I'm not a pain uh, specialist per se. Um, so I would imagine that the, the, the pain experts would, would know about more about that. Okay. Thank you very much. But, that, but that's a great idea. I'm sure it works for some people. And we also have a question from Coral Lindenhall from Ebenezer um, Bridges. Please go ahead. Hi. I was wondering if there's any elements that should really be included in a pain assessment that us nurses do, or is there a pain assessment you would recommend? I don't have anything specifically other than what I put on the slides in terms of using a pain scale or the, the Long Baker Faces thing or the PQRS. Um, I think it's important that whatever pain scale you use, two things come to mind. One is it should be consistently used throughout the institution by all the uh, clinical staff that are measuring pain. And uh, secondly, that if it's used today, it should be used tomorrow or the next week so that you can compare what the pain is today with what it was, say, yesterday or last week. I guess uh, what I was wondering is when we do our pain assessments out other than asking them what their pain is, one to ten, um, about descriptors so that we can tell whether or not it's more neuropathic or somatic or visceral or 
Um, I, I think that's where I was going with it. Um, okay, so the, the immediate answer for that, I think, is that if, in terms of distinguishing between neuropathic pain and visceral pain, I think when you come across them and they have pain, the question you want to ask, is this like the pain you've had before, and can you, can you tell me, is it more like your neuropathic pain, or is it a different type of pain? Um, we get this a lot with patients with migraines. So they may have migraine pain, but now they come in with a headache that is different. Okay. I had an 11-year-old have a conversation talking about the pain scale 1 to 10, and she said, when they asked me if my pain was 1 to 10, I said, are you talking about psychological pain or physical pain? Wow. That's interesting. Yeah, it made uh, me think about how we do our pain assessments. I guess that's why I was asking the question. Sure. And is this chronic pain? Um, no. So she just basically, that was basically a, a cold uh, cold answer to a cold question? It was. She said they, I, I don't know if they were talking about it in school, but she said they were talking about the pain scale 1 to 10, and you don't typically hear an 11-year-old or 12-year-old talk about that. And she said when they asked me, I said, psychological pain or physical pain? What are you asking me? Wow. I think an um, you know, 11-year-old that doesn't have any obvious source of pain right there, I would think it's probably more psychological. Just my gut feeling. Okay. Uh, but in terms of immediate treatment, I think I'd want to know, well, what's your physical thing? I was just kind of amazed that she would even say something like that because I think that, when we say pain, everybody thinks physical pain. That's that's a first for me. I don't think I've ever had an eleven year old to say that. That's amazing. Okay. Well, it made me think because when we ask our pain when we do our pain assessments in the elderly, we always assume we're talking about physical pain and maybe that isn't what they're trying to tell us. Good point. But and I think I, I think if you're trying to assess and you're having difficulty because of cognitive uh, impairment. Uh, again, I think it's helpful to go back in the chart and look and see what's been documented in the past. Might be a clue. Okay, thank you. Appreciate your time. You're welcome. Nice question. Are there, yeah, no more questions? questions in queue now. All right. Um, great. Um, I see uh, a few questions in the chat about certificates of completion, being mailed or emailed. Um, we are offering continuing education credits uh, for for nursing. Um, so you can go to this URL and um, complete the evaluation. The activity key is in the chat box right now along with a link to the URL. Um, you will also be transferred once you close, close this window um, directly to the URL for the um, evaluation. Thank you for joining us today uh, for the pain and assessment um, presentation. This presentation will be available on our LSQIN YouTube page uh, after the CE evaluation is closed. Um, you can view that and all of our past learning sessions at youtube.com slash LSQIN. At this time, the CE evaluation is open. Um, like I said, I put uh, the I put the uh, URL in the chat box. The activity key is pain15, lowercase p-a-i-n-1-5. Um, and this concludes our call for today. Thank you for attending.